Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Name of Fiend. Oh, Michael Dean. What's up? I'm recording. I'm actually writing your mother, so talk for a minute. Ah, you're writing my mother? Michael yeah. and my mom. They've got this unholy alliance. No, I guess it's cool. I guess it's cool that my mom digs it and she's not all like, why are you always being a fiend? <laughs> not that she talks like that. I mean, my mom's <laughs> middle all. aged. She's not old. She's younger so. than me, isn't she? Like a uh, year or two? No, no. She's probably a year or two older than you, I think. Uh, Not sure, though. I don't like to say things about my mom's age because I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, ladies don't like that. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I like stopped keeping track once I was a grown-up because it made me feel too old. <clears throat> I'm writing your mom and telling her what you want for Christmas. Yeah. It kind of follows well with our discussion yesterday. The other day. Of, mm-hmm. You know, people always get you the... The Lee Trevino putting challenge game when you want the bone storm game. So I'm writing your mom. <laughs> we were going to start about 10 minutes ago and your mom called like, what do you and uh, what do you and your wife want for Christmas? And I could hear you guys talking and I'm like typing to her on <laughs> Facebook playing Secret Santa saying Nima wants a sure SM58 microphone. Get one from yeah. Guitar Center. They'll yeah, try to upsell yeah. you to a bunch of, you know, get one from Guitar Center because it won't be counterfeit. Uh, they'll try, they work on commission. They'll try to upsell you to a whole bunch of other crap he doesn't need. Don't get it. Maybe if they have an extended warranty for over, for about 20 bucks, but uh, otherwise don't worry because that mic is indestructible. Yeah, true that, true that. Well, the, the mic she was going to get me uh, is a really good mic too, but it's a condenser mic and I want to avoid those. Uh, yeah, that's the Lee Trevino putting challenge. Of mine. <laughs> it is. It is. It's a good condenser mic as far as condenser mic goes, but uh, I don't know. I'm kind of done with those for now. I mean, maybe one day if I yeah. feel a use for them in the future, but uh, I actually why, have a, why agendas. All extra, why all the a, extra headache? I have agendas about, You've mic, got agendas? about mic descriptions. With, uh, it's, suggestions. It's, not even, it's not even the Fiend agenda show, though. I you know. have to save your agendas. Unless, no. you, unless, you, unless you ask nicely. We decided I have to save my agendas for shows that aren't the Sunday show where we get interrupted all the time because my agendas require uh, lengthy, lengthy talks. So this will be a uh, fiend's agenda here today. Um, okay. I'm really sick of people hearing me mention microphones or someone like today, Shaul Newman mentioned that he made a really cool thing. Did you see, it? Did you see the cool yeah. thing he made? Oh, he made that. Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. Yeah, it was about the yellow brick that. road to lip hair. Um, Roads. The dr- I thought it was the drone bombed road to Lip Air. <laughs> yeah. And he mentioned that we use uh the Sure Beta S M fifty seven or the Sure Beta fifty seven A microphone and one of his friends chimed in and said, Oh, yeah, I used to have one of those, but now I use a condenser mic, the USB bluebird, blah 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 blah. And I just railed at him. Okay, first of all, like I've been doing audio stuff literally since before that guy was born. And second of all, he is making an audio suggestion based on not having listened to us that's kind of like it reminds me of on gun forums of people who say oh well i have a 1911 so that's what everyone should have no you know if you're uh if you have a problem with uh rats in your backyard you probably want a shotgun with birdshot in it you know things are specific and yeah condenser mics are more sensitive and they're more sexy and they're more persnickety they're not as good for recording live radio because you 
you get, uh, you know, not only your voice, but the rustling of your shirt and the truck going by outside. Whereas with a dynamic mic, you just get your voice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could make an argument that maybe condenser mics are better for in studio by a pro. But uh, for me, I'd rather when I'm in studio recording something that's not live, I prefer my ribbon mic because it's just so much sexier. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a condenser mic is going to pick up like the needle going into my arm with the coca drill, the butt plug vibrator, you know, it's going to pick up all this crap that doesn't need to be on there. Just, we want my voice. So uh. F you to people who think they're, and you know what it is too. A lot of these people, like I don't want audio uh, suggestions from anybody who a hasn't heard our cast and B doesn't link something that they recorded. That sounds better. And a lot of people are gear nuts these days who can't record anything because gear's gotten cheap and the internet has made information available to where everyone who has a condenser mic and a USB mixer thinks they are a recording engineer. And they are not. A lot of it is skill and a lot of it is years of doing things wrong and right and finding the right way. So mm, yeah. I don't want to hear well, what's, audio what's suggestions guy, from those people. I, I, I was looking at this post and I felt like maybe you were taking something that wasn't really there in this post. Wait, like, you're saying yet that I misunderstood somebody and, and went to DEFCON 3 immediately? <laughs> How is that not Nima? You know Comments me so well. I would, things. I would never do that. Shut everything down yeah yeah <laughs> what, what is that from the, the the meme thing where it's three pictures of the same thing getting closer with blah 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 it's from a I movie isn't it i don't know but it's everyone hilarious. does it yeah yeah it's my yeah like that ever. thing the onion the uh, oatmeal thing on how to tell if your cat is a murderer ends ends with and in conclusion how much do cats kill and it says too damn much and it's the same picture of the <laughs> cat closer. getting closer yeah yeah. yeah 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 the only other meme i love more is uh ermigerd and then something you know with the the tilted verbs like ermigerd clerp clerps with the horse <laughs> and the they should do one of them together where it's like ermigerd clerp clerps <laughs> all the things closer. yeah <laughs> clerp clerp all the th- no that's too many it's yeah just clerp clerps yeah okay so i have another agenda okay it's is- it's just about what kind of people piss me off and really it's this is all indicative of a quality problem which is that so many people are into the fiends now that it's kind of overwhelming me um you know somebody said oh you should have a a bong hit bump for your for your podcast you know like I don't know, something with a bong hit. And I was like, oh, we have one of those. It's the Tyranny Today thing. And I uploaded an MP3 and put the link to it. Well, and somebody that was else a pipe, said, not a bong. That's what somebody so. else said. They said, I can't hear the bubbling. And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a pipe. I That's not my purview. Nima made it. And she's like, <laughs> oh, you should just go grab one off of this song by Sublime. They seem cool. They have a song about that has the word anarchy in it. They probably won't care. <laughs> Although I made that same mistake, I was gonna sample uh, participating in some anarchy and have that be a hook from their song uh, about the riot, which they got the wrong definition for anarchy in that song because it's a song about stealing things and yeah. trashing trashing a like, city, like the song uh, "Anarchy Burger Hold the Government," which is awesome. <laughs> um, Burger. Here's yeah. the thing, okay, and and I said I'm not gonna sample that. I I don't want to get sued, and she's like. Well, they'll be cool with it. And even if they're not, you know, it's not a melody. It's a sound effect. Okay. This person does not understand how major labels work. I've been on a major label. I've dealt with their attorneys. The way they work, and I've had to clear samples on a record, like one sample of just like one little sound effect, and it took longer than it did to record our record. Um, the way major labels work is even if they have no legal right to sue you for something, they will sue you anyways, because they have hundreds of lawyers on salary in the building. So it doesn't cost them anything more to initiate a lawsuit. They walk down and say, hey, Bill, you got time right now? Send this guy a cease and desist and and sue him if he doesn't. Um, I guess something like that, though. How do they know if it was a... Okay, so if it's a bong hit uh, with no other tone or music behind it, just the bong hit naked. Uh, if it's a kick drum, a snare drum, something how do they know? so small and short, how would they know? Like especially you put it, for you drum put it in You put it into a computer and match the sound print of it. It's what easy. If, what What if it's pitch shift? Uh, okay, let slightly. me finish what I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> the Freedom Fiends, um, Sublime, their label is one of the most litigious labels I've ever heard of. My friend Little Mike had 
permission from the band Sublime. Okay, my band Punk Floyd, which was a Pink Floyd cover band that did two gigs as a joke, um, mm-hmm. opened up for Sublime at Club Commotion in San Francisco. It was after they were big, but they were playing like, a, you know, hey, let's get on the street and play this after hours party kind of thing. And it was like, you know, we announced it that day and handed out flyers and it was packed out and the street was, you know, they were not letting people in. It was like a place that held like 200 people. Um, my friend, little Mike did a, did a soundboard recording of, well, I mean, that club recorded everything. You know, if you played there, there's a recording of it somewhere. So, um, little Mike was like to the singer who's now dead and to the other guys in the band, like, Hey man, I made a board recording of this. Do you mind if I press 500 of them on seven inch vinyl and I'll give you a hundred of them and you know, I'll sell them cheap and not really make any money, but it'll be kind of cool. And they're like, yeah, dude, you know, took another hit off the weed and went off the weeds and went, yeah, man, far out, do it. <laughs> Little Mike, you know, put all the money he had in putting this out. And he got lawyers like sh- process servers showing up at his house. Like we're going to take everything you have. And he had nothing. Uh-huh. And he was still like, you know, that's not a situation you want to be in. And this person yeah, seemed to yeah. think, you know, oh, they're cool. Go ahead and do it. I have personal secondhand experience of a really good friend of mine being screwed by making that assumption about that band with their permission. Okay. And just because people live in this like bubble about lawsuits. First of all, everybody says, I'm going to sue. Uh, my wife works at a law firm. She gets calls all day long from people who say, Somebody was slanderous against me. Will you take this on contingency? <laughs> Lawyers don't take that on contingency. Or no. or I've been sued by somebody. Will you take this on contingency? You know, like when you're being sued, there's nothing to win for the lawyer to take a, a cut of. You know, about 10% of the calls she takes at the law firm are telling people, I'm sorry, we don't do that. And they often get really indignant. Uh, yeah, because they told all their friends, I'm suing, oh, yeah. I'm going to get so much money, and then they have to go back and tell their friends, I'm an idiot, I don't know yeah. anything. And they don't realize, like, the, the kind of things lawyers take on contingencies are something where there's a moderate to good chance where the person suing is going to get millions. Then a lawyer might take something on contingency. If there's a really low chance you're going to get sued, like, you know, Fox News mentioned me in passing and called me part of the problem. You know, <laughs> they're not going to take that because Fox mm-hmm. News can legally do that. Uh, the thing that's really ridiculous to try to get a lawyer for on contingency is I'm being sued by some major corporation. Take this on contingency because there's nothing for the lawyer to recover. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So people and people are Cause, also cause you're not, not going to counter sue them. Right. For going out right. for pursuing their copyright. It won't work. And, you know, at best, you'd spend a, basically what she's saying is, no, man, in my limited view of the law, you'd be right to do this. And if they tried to sue you, you could just say, neener, 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 it's not a melody, which is just ridiculous because, you know, mechanical rights, ownership of, uh, of masters, you know, it's like they own everything on it in the eyes of the law. And no matter what well, you think, ex- explain those things then, because uh, what what is a mechanical right and what is... I mean, ownership of the master sounds pretty self-explanatory, but uh, that's mechanical but- rights. Mechanical rights are the own uh, the owning of that recording, and then the other kind of uh, royalties are like the song. So, if I record a song by Sublime and put it out by my band, I only have to pay the one kind of royalties, the songwriting royalties. But if I sample a song or a ch- chunk of a song by the band, I have to pay the songwriting royalties and the mechanical royalties. Now, ah. if you only sampled a bong hit, that's not a melody, you'd still have to pay mechanical royalties, but not but the not songwriting, songwriting royalties. royalties. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I don't believe all this stuff should exist, but it does exist. I also don't believe, I also believe you should be able to, you know, morally, you should be able to walk down the street, open carrying a machine gun while shooting coca drill uh, with a vibrator up your butt, probably as long as the vibrator is not sticking out for all the children to see. Um, I don't, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. So if you morph something to where their bot can't figure it out, uh, how good are their bots? Like if I pitch shift something up or down, you know, not even a whole note, like something that's not even a semitone. Like You're better off. Semitone. You're better off. But uh, even so, you know, best, the best thing to do if you're going to sample things from is, first of all, find really obscure records. 
prob- probably not on major labels. Um, well, really obscure records is is not even just a legal thing. That's a sound thing. I mean, yeah, you don't that, want to sample something everybody yeah, knows because it's that's retarded. And, it, and it's kind of a isn't that a hip hop thing of like I found the cool jazz flute loop from 1968. Yes, that you don't have on your record, so I'm cooler than you. Yes, it's a skill yeah. called crate digging. Mm-hmm. Ah, going through the record stores and looking through the crates. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Yeah. So uh, you're better off with it, but how good are the bots? Here's how good the bots are. Okay, my band Bomb did one record on Warner Brothers. We used one of the Bomb songs from a really, you know, the band, the record didn't sell well. It sold about 10,000 records, which on a major label gets you dropped and got us dropped. Um, on, a, on an indie label, that's a smashing success, but... You know, we got dropped from Warner Brothers. This was way pre-internet, way pre-database, way pre-computer everything. You know, computers in the music industry then were used to keep the spreadsheets for accounting, and that's it. <laughs> they, they were not used to record and track everything and or upload edit. to YouTube and edit, yeah, yeah. and make sounds. Um, so you and I put a bomb song, my band bomb, at the end of a you know hour and a half Freedom Fiends cast once, and some friend of ours uploaded it to YouTube. And he said, like, the second it finished uploading, it had an ad on it that said, buy this song on iTunes. And it had, mm-hmm. then it had ads on the video that Warner Brothers and YouTube were splitting the money on. Well, I know the bots are that good, but that was an unadulterated full length song, which is different from taking a piece of a song and mutating it. And what, what I'm asking is, how good do you think the bots are at recognizing something that's been morphed and is, isn't is a full-length thing? Not that I, good, I, but getting better. Getting better. And, okay. you know, I mean, the thing is, if if someone's goal is to make their music as popular as possible, the more popular it is, the more chance you're going to get lawyer letters. Right. And right. lawyer right. letters... You know, you can just ignore them, but it's kind of like not paying your taxes. I mean, eventually men will come to your house with guns. <laughs> and in civil suits, you know, they probably won't throw you in jail. They will come take everything you have. And you can say, well, I don't have anything. They will garnish everything you make above, you know, you, you're going to have to live in the black economy forever if you if you think that's going to mm-hmm. be your plan. Mm-hmm. It just mm-hmm. seems a really, um, you know, I had a really long day doing all this work for the Freedom Fiends and losing money doing it and somebody i think she was being like fun like trying to have fun with me not even making fun of me just being playful but i took it the wrong way and went to defcom 3 and i was like i'm not taking requests man i've had a really long day i've been working really hard and i want to watch a movie before i get up and do it again and you know she kept hammering at me at like well, no, man. I mean, you should just take it off this record. And I'm like, I'm not taking requests. And then I deleted the thread. <laughs> Didn't block her, though. She's a good person. And I like, you know, she's yeah. a Fiend fan. But yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay. So fair enough. Although we do sometimes take requests, but maybe Facebook. Here's the thing, too. Uh, I don't know. Email us a talk back. Maybe then Michael won't go Duff Con 3 on you. Because <laughs> I can't be do always, it as quickly. It se- se- seems to be always Facebook. on Facebook when, when, it, when it's the real-time feedback yeah. that you're yeah. just kind of like, I don't want to do this right now. <laughs> yeah. Whereas with emails, I just read them and delete them mm. if I don't yeah. like them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Which uh, I, thought, I thought it was important to say, um, you know, talk back is still there, and we're not saying don't ever use talk back. What, what we were pushing for earlier was don't use talk back for tyranny today, daily yeah. news kind of stuff. And I had to go through all the bumps. Um, Hesperus pointed out, like, we used a bump after we said, don't ever email us show ideas. Put them on the place on the website that's for that, the show prep page. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I accidentally, I just grabbed something out of a folder while I was editing and didn't listen to it. And he's like, Hey, I thought you said, you know, like caught you. Mm-hmm. So I had to go mm-hmm. through all of them. And, uh, so basically what I'm saying is what I like from fiends is people who donate and occasionally amuse us or tell us something <laughs> brilliant, not pe- or, or do things like Hesperus does, which is work on the blog, you know, or, or, or tell us how much they like us. Yeah. What I don't <laughs> that's, like, that's what I don't like is people who never donate, never contribute any, anything really useful, but just come on and go, you should do this because this is what I'd do if I had my crap together enough to have a podcast. So you should do it and then tell me over and over and over. Don't do that. And don't tell me what microphones to use or any sound tips until you've heard the podcast and you send me a link to something you did that sounds better. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, you know, I would also like to give a shout out to somebody um, 
or to two people, right? We we've got a, a fiend fan who um who emailed me and told me how much he likes Frank's blog post on the fiend's blog. Nice, um, because it just fills his heart with such joy that the young people that there are young people who get it and uh frank has sort of proven that to him so uh shouts out to frank shouts out to the fiend fan and to those who haven't checked it out yet go check out the blog it's uh it it's worth your while it's it's fiends in visual format instead of audio format yeah basically. you can read it at work you can steal time from your boss give yourself a raise by reading the fiends for a half hour mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so yeah it's a plug slash shout out right there all at the same time so speaking of audio things uh going on with that previous riff we are trying something new and i really liked it and you really liked it we're making yeah. even even though you and i talking over mumble is mono all the bumps and all the intros are now stereo, and the whole cast is stereo, right. and the parts where we're talking is two channels of mono. It's really cool, and it actually makes me – I think it makes you want to listen to the ads more because it's like it opens up, and it's like it's like going through this trudging mm-hmm. road to freedom, and then all of a sudden it opens up into this forest for a couple minutes, and then you go back and have to trudge with Nima and Michael for another 20 well, minutes. You know what? It's kind of like how on TV ads are like uh, – louder and flashier yeah. and there's more visual things going on like there's twice as many uh things that catch your eye it's like uh, that so, yeah, without like annoying that. but it, it doesn't make you want to run in the other room and get a sandwich which is why they do that with ads so you can hear it from the other room literally i mean that was ah. something they figured out in the 40s uh-huh. you didn't know that uh-huh. they figured out on, a, on radio i didn't know i didn't Actually, know it was probably the, the 30s it's probably the 30s yeah it was, it was radio hmm Hmm. Yep. Ah, well, that's now nice the, of them, then, isn't it? And now the isn't nannies, it? the nannies want to outlaw that, didn't they? They, I, they did in, in, Cal- in California, right? Didn't they? The bill passed. I don't know where. It how went can after you? That. How can you regulate like how audio goes across state lines, <laughs> man? What a delusional. Well, well, it wasn't a federal thing. It was a California only. So it was. Yeah, but you know, I mean. You know, radio stations go across state lines, and cable uh. cable programming goes across state lines. Speaking of which, of cable nannying, um, there's a new law that just passed that's going to allow cable uh, cable content create you know not creators but cable companies to do a two tiered billing system. Uh-huh. Um, basically, right now. The the basic cable on cable is unscrambled, and all of yep. the pay channels are scrambled. And they passed a law to where they can scramble the basic channels. So what may happen is you may have to have two or three cable boxes coming up here in a few months. Uh, you know, like they're going to say, well, we're going to scramble all of it. You're going to have to order it and maybe pay mm-hmm. for it, and they're going to come into your home and have to, you know, put something else in that may have microphones in it, according to Alex Jones or cameras. But who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is um NBC Business. I saw them cover this, uh, and it's it's a I don't know. The thing is, I, I guess. The government shouldn't be involved, so it seems kind of silly to me that the cable operators have to get a, a bill passed or have to get the FCC to change the rules in the first place. I don't think you should have to go with your hat in hand to an organization like the FCC to do something like this. But uh, at the same time, I don't like the way cable companies operate in the first place. Um, that's why I don't pay a monthly fee that's exorbitant for cable. And uh, I feel like people will get really upset with this. I don't think that uh, it's going to help the cable industry in the long run. Um, I think people will keep moving more and more away from cable. In fact, I'm going to – I'm doing a, a focus group today. I'm part of a focus group. I'm getting paid uh, $100 to sit there for an hour and a half and tell them why cable sucks. Um, <laughs> oh, my. So that Yeah, you know fun. what? With those things – uh, they may discount you. They'll probably pay. They'll pay you, but they'll throw you out probably because you will have too many opinions and you know too much. They, I mean, you really. There's a thing on Thirty Rock where they do a, a focus group, and it's like Jack is actually doing it. The vice president of of NBC is doing, or the president of NBC is doing it, and he's like in this room with these slack jawed lo- yokels saying, holding a pizza that's open and wafting it under their noses and saying, if you say you like it, you get some pizza. Like, <laughs> uh. If you start talking about lib pair and competition and true markets, they're just going to go, get out of here, man. And the, and the Maybe, check, collect your check on the way out. They've already agreed to pay me the money, so I don't care. <laughs> now, <laughs> if, it's for, is, if it's the same amount of money for less time, hey, that, is, that is suits the, me fine. Is the fact that you were on TV part of why they got you, or is it for anybody? 
No, the 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 reasoning is because uh, they asked me this question like three times. And they had people to call and confirm. Um, it seems like this is what they're looking for. They're looking for people who no longer have monthly cable service, but had it within the past few years. And I used to have uh, it about three years ago. So it's going to be. What people- would it take to get you back? That's right, what they right. want to know. Okay, Ex- exactly, good. exactly. And uh, and my answer right now is, is nothing, barring the only the only way I could see doing something like that is. If they, if they, if it was more a la carte, right? Like Hulu or, or, uh, Netflix, but, uh, similarly priced, uh, maybe for a whole channel, right? It'd be nice to get the whole channel of Comedy Central or the whole channel of Cartoon Network, or even just split Cartoon Network in half and just give me the adult swim programming. You know what I'd like really that. like is if I could delete channels I never watch from showing up. Like, literally, I have to scroll through, like, 40 sports channels and like 20 Spanish language channels and not pay for them. Right. I, I mean, don't pay for them. I don't, ex- I don't, I don't, I don't want them. I don't get them. The real thing is I don't mind that they're on the plate so much. Cause it, I don't think it'd be much cheaper. It might be nice if it were, if they weren't on there, but I literally have to skip through them to get, you know, from the 200 ah. block to the six, 700 block or the 500 block. And literally it it's, you know, it's more mousing, it's more pushing and it's like 50 channels, you know, the, mm-hmm. there's 10 golf channels, <laughs> Fox golf. I will never watch Fox golf. Right. Right. I, I kind of feel like th- they've got, they've got the idea that there are varied interests and an infinite number of things that people could want. And so they offered a lot of variety, but what they're missing is that not every consumer needs access to all of this content. Um, and there, and there are consumers that, uh, instead of paying $150 a month for, uh, for all of this content, will just pay eight bucks a month and just watch Netflix or Hulu or pay 16 bu- mu- bucks a month and get both of them and have all of their TV needs pretty much laid out. You know what I could probably do? Um, I could probably activate the V chip thing for like parents and block all those channels as obscene. <laughs> Cause I know when you do that, the titles don't show up. Like, you know, I mean, I get titles like, you know, hot, horny moms inserting things in masturbating. Like if you, if you block that, you know, your kids can't see it. It doesn't even show mm-hmm. up. It jumps. I could probably go through and spend an afternoon blocking the hundred or 200 channels I never watch. Then they wouldn't show up, but then they'd come out in six months with, I have to buy a new cable box for my basic cable and I'd have to do it all over again. So <laughs> now how would that work different in lip pair? I think if things weren't regulated, there would be different systems and they would actually listen to people like me. They'd hire me. Everyone should consult with me on everything. And I'm, I'm serious, <laughs> man. It's like so many people try to do things with technology and then screw up and then ask me. And I'm like, well, you should have done it this way. You would have saved yourself a lot of trouble. Well, I, I feel like here's the thing with uh, my problem with cable just being you're paying a lot of money for a lot of content you don't watch. And most people I know have like three to five tops channels that they regularly watch. I have about game. 10. Okay, 10. That, that's a lot, but 10 uh, as opposed to how many channels are available to you? Do you 758. Think? And those are channels that you pay for and you can watch, or, or it's 758 that show up on your box? Because um, there's some that show up on your box that you can't watch. About 600 I can watch. There's a bunch of Showtime ones that are pay that I can't watch, and a bunch of porn ones right. I can't watch. But So, so 10 out of 600 what's that what one, one one over 60 one over yeah. 60 yeah that's that's how much, that's how little of the tv that's like one and a half 1.5 yeah. percent something like that right and i feel like part of the reason it works like that is because there's what like five or something uh companies that own all of those channels well i think um, that we're paying for them that helps drive the price down for everything and drive their price margin up to where they want to do it Right, right, but I also feel like uh, in LibPair you wouldn't have this um, these mega corporations, all of them uh, having such a tight hold over the TV market. The barriers to entry to having a TV station or a TV channel would be a lot smaller. So I think you'd have more, but I think you'd also have a bigger diversity of companies who uh, who could have a TV channel, and so you'd have maybe fifty, a hundred, a thousand. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, channels channels in LibPair and companies in LibPair, and so that competition would drive the price down. And then you wouldn't have cable companies that that forced not forced you, but that would put everything in this package and only sell that one package so that they can make the five companies happy. Yeah, if I could play play, play if I could pay one point five percent of what I'm paying now, uh, that'd be nice. I don't think it would work though. Well, well, cause, well, because I feel like the thing is, Viacom says, um, you know, 
if you're going to take MTV, if you're going to offer MTV to all your customers as a basic service, then you also have to offer, uh, I don't know, Comedy Central, yeah, VH1, yeah. and whatever else. Right. Um, so I, I, I feel like in LibPair, you wouldn't have this problem because, A, you wouldn't really have corporations as they exist now. Uh, B, also, you, wouldn't ha- you wouldn't have uh, a regulatory body like the FCC that would uh, erect so many barriers to entry and, uh, and basically keep the big boys at the top and keep little people from coming up and, and taking over and pushing the big yeah, boys Yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of things are done old technology way that new technology would make – uh, would open it up to a lot more people. Like, for instance, uh, even terrestrial radio, which, you know, like the stations are kind of far apart, so they don't mesh over each other. But with digital transmitters mm-hmm. and digital receivers, you could have 10 channels in what they have, the space they have one channel now. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. satellite costs could come down a lot if private satellites could be launched right. and there wasn't as much. Uh, I mean, for instance, a friend of mine tried to inquire as to what it would be to get their own channel on XM Sirius Satellite Radio, it's $175,000 a month to start. A month? Jesus. All right. So you got to have a million bucks a year. And then you have to get people to listen more. to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's outrageous. And and I think you're right. I, th- I think the fact that the regulatory bodies are so slow to catch up to new technological paradigms that you have old models uh, still trying to to work um, when the technology is new. When you could have new opportunities and new ways of doing things, you don't get the innovation to translate as quickly as you would uh, sans the regulatory bodies. We do things with the internet, and we're going to go sell some things on the internet. Yeah. Although then probably the federal regulatory bodies of interstate commerce will... Nobody buys our stuff, so it doesn't matter. So here we go. (laughs) Hi, I'm Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends. And like you, I'm concerned with privacy on the Internet. The electronic police state is strangling our previous protections, and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives. That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B O L E H V P N dot net. A science fiction comic adventure from Big Head Press. Quantum Vibe. It's year 2523. There are colonies on Venus, Mars, and Mercury. People travel in bubbles, fly at hyperspeed. With brain implants and artificial gravity. A scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system. On a secret mission to find the key to access new frontiers and save liberty. Quantum vibe. There's a robot girl and zany creatures made with genetically engineered features. And corporate villains crave the opportunity to steal a profit from others ingenuity. A scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system. On a secret mission to find the key to access new frontiers and save liberty. Quantum vibe.com. Would you like to advertise your product or service to a large built-in audience of liberty-loving consumers who truly dig the free market? Freedom Fiends is now selling ad space. Slots are reasonably priced, but limited, so contact us today. Write the Fiends at talkback at freedomfiends.com. That's talkback at freedomfiends.com. Hey, Nima, do you know where the word conservative came from? Um, you let me know earlier, and um, I had kind of gotten a hint from that. Apparently, it comes from uh, the French Revolution era, as the people who didn't want uh, a revolution. Yeah, people it was, wanted to it was, serve the old order. Right. It was the word the conservative was the uh, French word for monarchist parliamentarists, uh, uh, mar- monarchist poli- parliamentarians opposed to revolution. So, mm-hmm. 
conservative basically means old, rich king in a white powdered wig who wants to uh, tell you let them eat cake because mm-hmm. they don't want you to engage in the market. <laughs> Isn't that also where uh, the concept of left versus right comes from? Uh, yeah, during and the French, conserv- French Revolution where, where the leftists would sit on the left, uh, the rightists would the sit parliament. on the right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, con- conservatives were basically the people whose heads they were speaking of when they said off with their heads. <laughs> Nice. But nice. it's really square, man. If you call yourself a conservative, you're basically saying, I want I want things done my way and nothing should ever change. And mm-hmm. the government is good and it will protect my people. And who cares <laughs> about your people? And, yeah. you know, I mean, I agree with conservatives 100% of end welfare today. I don't believe in half measures of uh drug test welfare recipients i just scrap it man or scrap it over six months time or whatever but that would also include ending corporate welfare which is a lot more money than private welfare you know i don't get that upset about welfare i mean i do but i get a lot more upset about the military because the Mm -hmm. military spends and wastes a lot more money to kill people who are innocent uh and all of the government crap like the tsa i saw a great thing the other day it was a tsa guy finding a rubik's cube it was a drawing of a tsa guy pulling a rubik's cube out of a luggage some luggage and looking at it suspiciously and it said i've discovered a terrorist said no tsa agent ever (laughs) nice nice that's wonderful um yeah and the the thing about conservatives is even the good conservatives, like the ones that get it and are anti-war and and uh, you know anti-tax, uh, and and the ones that aren't you know rhinos and, and and the ones that aren't in power anymore, the ones that want to reduce government to the size where they can drown <laughs> it in the bathtub. Well, I, I've I've heard them say things like you know. Us conservatives, we should be anti-war because it it is against what conservatism is really about. And they say conservative conservatism is really about preserving the culture. It's preserving the way things exist as they did, you know, now or in the recent past or even in the little bit further back past. It's all about conserving the values that they they hold and believe, which I find a problem with because. Um, it doesn't give any kind of credence to specific value systems or beliefs. It doesn't say, well, the non-aggression principle is great and superior. It just says the whatever old was in the past. The old, the old ways are good. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that that's the first problem. And and B, um, there also seems a problem like why should why should any system be in a perpetual state of of status quo? I feel like all that leads to is stagnation. Uh, I mean, anything in nature has to constantly refresh itself, adapt itself. Well, if it's a lot. Survive. A lot of religious conservatives don't believe in the theory of evolution as a fact. So there you go. But it's not even evolution. You don't even have to believe in evolution for it. Just go out and just think of water, it's, right? It's, I mean, well, they always talk about the free market. I love the free market. The market is change. The market is adaptation. Right. Exactly. And they always have this view of, well, not always. I don't want to speak of them collectively, but a lot of them I've listened to have this view of, going back to the past and you know their their idea of the perfect past is somewhere between it's it's a combination of like right after the american revolution and leave it to beavers 19 1950 right. leave it to beavers leave it to beavers so i mean really you're saying like okay i want slavery or i want uh jim crow <laughs> jim crow laws yeah segregation yeah well uh, I mean, I I guess the way I feel about it is there probably are some things about society that might have been better in the past. I'm sure there are. Um, but if those things are good, they will uh, be reintroduced through progress. Uh, we will go back to them through progress uh, adapted to uh, modern technology and modern ways of doing things. Like and Colorado instance, legalizing weed isn't going to destroy that. It's going to no. help it. No. And if it does destroy something, if, if there is something destruct, well, I guess there would be nothing destructive about it. But if there's something destructive about something like, say, smoking pot, um, market interaction will weed that out. And, and people will weed. destruct themselves. If, if weed destructs people, those people will be destructed and they will become marginal actors in the economy and in society. And thus people growing up will stop to do that, will stop doing that because they don't want to be marginal actors. They want to be moderately successful or successful. Um, so, so the market and, and free trans, free interaction is what really, um, 
what really tempers life and society. And that's all we need, really. Worms. You know, I heard something destructive about pot. Uh, some kids at the University of Colorado in Denver were like, oh, weed's legal. So they made some, some pot brownies and brought them and fed them School. to their teacher and, and <laughs> some students without telling them they were pot brownies. Uh, and that's not one, cool. of the, one of the chicks flipped out and had a panic attack and ended up in yep. the hospital. That's really not cruel, cool, and that's, that'd be a crime in Libpair, I think. Yeah, it would be, it'd be fraud. It'd be fraud. Um, fraud, I think it'd be fraud and assault. I think I think sending some pot brownies are it, po- almost, poisoning poisoning somebody is, yeah, is assault, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, um, yeah. And I do think but fraud again, violates you know, the non-aggression I, I, principle because but, it 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 changes your behavior in the absence yeah. of information. So so if if you defraud me, if, if if I give you money under fraudulent purposes, it's no different than stealing. My property has been taken under uh, false pretense, so it, it's still aggression. Yeah, and you know, but under those same laws in Libpair, I think fluoridating your water and not giving you a choice would be the same crime. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and the thing that was in the article I read that was re- the school was really upset about. You know, the they dosed them. But they were also upset about. Uh, that the school could lose federal funding because they they're literally in this weird dependent welfare quandary. The school in Colorado, the schools in Colorado, the colleges, because they oh, have yeah. to abide by federal law with regards to marijuana and everything, or they lose all of their government teat. So that's what mm-hmm. that was their main concern of the university. Yeah, yeah, and you know that that is the worry too. Is even if states take a stand, uh, a legal stand. Um, they still have to worry about that always. I mean, Louisiana tried to take a legal stand against the federal uh, drinking age being 21 instead of 18. Louisiana held out the longest, and the way the feds won in the end is they just withheld uh, highway funds. Yeah, Montana so, did that with uh, – they got rid of the speed limit, and there were no when, when more – was, When it was 55 federally they, mandated? They got rid of it completely and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. They were, were raised it to 85 or 90 or something. And nice. there were no – more accidents i think there were for a couple weeks and then people learned how to do it and or the people who are assholes just died (laughs) and and then it tapered off and it was a better place to live and uh the federal government was like no you can't do that we're going to take away your money for roads and uh Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so they got them by the balls they got them by the balls yeah, man. So that's what I worry about. And and maybe that's why the president is taking so long to actually officially address it is he's compiling uh, a strategy to whip them back into shape um, and, and probably deciding whether he should or not, whether this is a battle he should take, because this is a battle the feds can win in the short run. But uh, but what does it do to people's minds? How does that affect consent of the governed? Um, because I feel like they have to know that people are getting more and more fed up, don't they? Or are they that thick? Uh, I think it's more of a like, because we say so, and they don't really care what the people think. You know, the government that's supposed to represent people democratically. I mean, it's a weird tipping point because the latest polls say that something like 53, 54% of adults surveyed nationwide say they're in favor of decriminalizing marijuana federally nationwide but i I still feel like the feds fear us to some extent that's why they go through all this trouble for ndaa um and the tsa and all these things is they want to keep us in line but they i think that at some level at least some of them know that there's a balance they have to tow especially with timing i feel like they they understand that people get used to these things, so there's a timing they have to go through while they're tyrannizing us. Kind of a boiling frog kind of metaphor, uh, cliche thing. Um, they're obsolete, so, so I, man. I, I, I they're obsolete, I, I, and they're protecting their jobs. You know, I mean, right? The, right. But, mo- but, but, but they cops, know that. They, they most know cops. Most cops and federal prosecutors would really not have much of a job if they legalized weed, man. If they really did it across the board, I mean. Something like 60, 70 percent of all arrests are pot or pot related. And you get rid of that and it's like the, you start to see the man behind the curtain, you know, the, the, the little wizard pretending he's huge. You start to see that you really don't need as many of those, if any of them, you know, even the minarchist, mm-hmm. even the average person can notice, you know, this isn't keeping us safe. My cousin's in jail for weed. He's a nice guy. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll broken window fallacy it and say we need we need to get rid of these state laws for the fiscal cliff reasons. We'll go off a fiscal cliff if we keep pot legal because all these cops will be out of jobs. So yeah, maybe they'll take that my, kind of strategy. My belief is that eventually 
way beyond the point of they they need to do it, which was about 20 years ago and is really obvious now because the majority believes it in this country supposedly runs on one of those. Um, if they want to look like they're useful, you know, the government, uh, the cops, all of those people, they're some, well, the cops will never be in, in favor of it, but I believe some politician, possibly Barack Obama, will legalize pot with the poke the stroke of a pen at some point not legal legal but like alcohol is now uh hmm. to be and and they will just the economy will boom man because they'll be stealing so much taxes over it and all these people won't have to be i i mean i it, there won't be the broken well, window fallacy think about all the people arrested. that would run out and and start their own hash bar or dispensary i mean i feel like overnight you'd have a ton of people jumping into the market for something like you wouldn't that. be able to You'd be, it'd be like alcohol. Can you go start a bar on your block right now? No, but people people do plan for that, and people do like to have bars. There are people that uh, that enjoy their craft brews and want to make a brewery or a bar, and and they do that. Um, if because there's there's a legal avenue for them to do it. Maybe maybe it wouldn't be people rushing out and doing it overnight, but I feel like there would be a lot of people who would decide to finally take a leap and jump into it. Um, you know, I guess that's the problem with with still having a state control it is obviously what needs to happen is they need to just take their hands off and they never would. You know, you mention NDAA almost every cast and you've never defined it. I think you should take a moment and do that. Ah, the NDAA. Well, it's something that comes up every year. It's the National Defense Authorization Act, and it's sort of an umbrella that includes all things evil almost. It's it's basically what uh, money the government allots for what nefarious uh, war and def- "Quote unquote defense purposes, and this includes domestic defense, um, which includes reason, spying on us, which includes spying and on us, feeling and, up our butt right. at the airport." And what, one of the reasons it's become so contentious, and people have been talking about it so much lately, is um, about a year ago during last New Year's. It was was it New Year's Eve or New Year's Day? But uh, at the turn of the year, uh, Obama signed the one that was the last one, and it included authorization. Um, for the federal government to indefinitely detain people in America, uh, regardless of who they are, uh, American citizens included, indefinitely detain them. Um, that means throw in a cage forever is what indefinitely without, detain Without means. a lawyer, without a trial, without being charged. Right, right. It basically takes the Bill of Rights and takes a red and marker. Sticks and sticks it up their butt. It, <laughs> I was going to say draws a red X on it, but fair enough. Sticks it up their butt because I'm sure it does give them some kind of sick pleasure as well. Um, well, the NDAA is also a dumping ground for all sorts of horrible mm-hmm. bills that they tack on at the last minute that are completely unrelated to defense. You know, they'll put in the right. like, well, we need to make uh, drugs more of a felony and we need to regulate this kind of trigger switch on a gun and we need to. Uh, have funding for NPR and uh, Planned Parenthood. I mean, they put anything in there they're trying to pass mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. almost nobody doesn't vote for it in Congress because everyone says, you're not American if you don't mm-hmm. vote for it. Right, because it's a funding bill for uh, the military um, or the defense, the defense, the military industrial complex, right? So if, if you don't vote for it, people say, oh, well, you hate the troops. Why won't you support our troops? You want yeah. the people over there fighting to go hungry and not have money to send home to their yeah, wives. Yeah, because you know, they always put something in it that looks good for the troops, like more job training or – uh, or is good for the troops, you know, more job training or better. Well, I'm not hundred percent sure on this, but isn't that where the troops paycheck comes from? Like if, that, yeah, if, yeah. if they don't do it, oh, then yeah. the troops yeah. are, are working for free and better bulletproof vests and things like that, that like anybody who knows anybody in the military would be labeled insane for not supporting, but they put 10,000 things in all of these line item, Vita, everything. And it's like, you can't pick and choose, so they have to sign it all. So anyway, that's mm-hmm. how Congress works, and it's a bunch of bullshit, and we hate it, and let's move on. Well, hold on. Before we move on, uh, in the last cast, I mentioned that even George Bush has vetoed one of these NDAAs that Obama hasn't vetoed yet. Why? Even though Obama- the reason he vetoed it was because there was a um, there was a clause in there that would have allowed Americans who had been tortured by the Iraqi Saddam Hussein regime, it would have allowed them to um, to sue the current Iraqi government now there's some problems with that like because it wasn't the same government anymore and you know in lip pair what you would do is you would sue the people who tortured you like the actual person like Farheem Mahargaba uh, instead of suing this entity That's called the government but uh, 
But George Bush was like, no, Iraq's our friends right now. We don't want anybody suing them for torturing us. <laughs> so, so he vetoed it so that Americans couldn't sue their torturers well, in so Iraq. Well, so did, did the troops go without paychecks, or did they take that out and run it through they, again? They, they took it out and run it through. George Bush just got what he wanted. So if, if Obama... If, if Obama was honest and really wanted to close down Guantanamo or really wanted to stop indefinite detention, all he would have to do is veto it and say, hey, bring me something on my desk that doesn't have these horrible evil things in it, and I will, I will sure as, as shit sign it. Uh, but Obama See, is, is a liar who doesn't really want those things to happen, so he won't. This is the part of the cast when I did the sound check and said, okay, now talk really loud like you do when you get angry about the state. <laughs> That's the volume I'm looking at. I'm turning you down and I'm going, come on, man, let's get off of this. This is what all the other podcasts talk about. I don't want to talk about this. But, yeah, I asked you and then I said, shut up. You talked about it. You answered too well. So, um, <laughs> okay. I saw something really funny. It was uh, stickers you can buy. They're about an inch in diameter. They're round. No, about two inches in diameter. And they come in a sheet of like 16 of them and they say, the TSA touched me here. <laughs> you put them anywhere on your body. You put them on before you go into TSA. That'd be kind of funny. Nice. Nice. Yeah, man. Have you, you haven't gone up through one of those feel ups yet. Have you? Mm, yeah. I've traveled once by plane post nine 11. No, actually I've traveled a bunch, but it got a lot worse in the past few years, but I haven't gone right. through the feel up. No, I flew last time I flew was DJ and I went back to see my family in about 2007. And uh, it was just standard. The only thing that was unstandard about it was the lines. I mean, it, they hadn't really figured out what to do or how to do it yet. And it was LA X mm -hmm. and it was like the line was down the block. I mean, it was like two Ugh. and a half hours. We, I'm glad we got there early. It was like two and a half hours between the time we arrived and the time we got through the gate to through the thing to go to our gate. Mm, mm. Yeah. Those feel ups aren't fun and you should count yourself lucky. I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to fly. So we were talking about NGOs yesterday and how horrible uh, they yeah. are. And then we were talking about um, how we want to be on the SPLC's watch list. Although I don't really know if I do, because they'd probably take something absurd out of context and call us racist. And then everyone think we're racist or something. And you know oh, yeah. that me and my Brown friend are racist, racist doing this podcast. But the thing we didn't mention is the SPLC is, is an, an NGO. NGO. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. SPLC NGO and SPLC was name. Oh. <laughs> so, what the hell do people mean by I love my country, but I hate my government or I don't trust my government? Uh, they mean that everybody in Washington, D.C. and the various state capitals and the various city halls are all douchebags and don't deserve to have a monopoly of violence against us. But at the same time, they love cultural things from America like hot dogs, apple pie, baseball, hip hop, etc. See, I've heard you say that even with that explanation, but more often what I hear when people say that more often what it's, they seem to mean is I don't like the government now. I want it to go back to a combination <laughs> of what it was during leave it to beaver and right, right after right. the American revolution. Right. Which is kind of like Republicans want a limited government. They want a government limited to only Republicans. Yeah. That's a John Stewart line. <laughs> that's pretty good. Is it? Is yeah. it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Although you probably came out with it independently. It's a pretty good. one. No, no. I heard it from uh, Lawrence Vance uh, who writes on Lou Rockwell's blog. Well, he stole it. Speaking of uh, getting credit for things, I came up with something button worthy yesterday. And, you know, we talked at one point about like, man, I wish we had the power that Scott Horton does to where we could just wake up and email somebody and with a slogan and they'd come up with a bumper sticker. And I realized we do, man. We're in with Krizzle. So I, the, the title of yesterday's cast, Krizzle actually uh, retweeted that cast and he makes buttons for people like us. You know, you send him a design, he makes it and you pay him and he ships them to you. But he also makes buttons of his own design and sells them. And I know that the way to get things done is not to say, you owe me money, you have to pay a percentage. You just say, you can use this. So I wrote him and said, you know, what was, what was the, yesterday's cast? Oh, state speech is hate is speech. Is hate speech. And I said, if you want to make a button of that, I'm fine with it if you link the fiends and said I made it. And it wasn't even about me getting credit. It was just basically I'd like to get a link for the fiends. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, send me 10 of them and you can do it and keep all the money. And he was like, right on. And the idea I gave him, because he's, he's an anarcho-syndicalist. So I said, I think you should make two designs, one that's red and black and one that's gold and black. 
Mm, and he nice. loved it. And he's making nice. he's making them today. So there awesome. will be – they're not going to say the Freedom Fiends or anything. They're just going to say state speech is hate speech. So if that goes well, that's going to be our new hobby is making up designs and letting Krizzle uh, yeah. make money off them. Because Crystal should branch out into bumper stickers or something then. Because I don't know. How many people a day do buttons. you see buttons? You don't hang out in Portland, man. You don't hang out in San Francisco. <laughs> you don't hang out with punk rockers. Buttons are still big. And okay. there are a lot. I think more people want to use them than bumper stickers. Bumper stickers, you're like messing up your car, you know? And bumper yeah, stickers yeah. are kind of tacky and buttons are kind of cool. And he does buttons really, really, really well. Saying he, he should does. do bumper stickers is like me saying, hey, you do good opera. You should you good hip hop. You should do opera too, you know? <laughs> or you should do hip 80s. Opera. You should do 80s style metal, mm, which mm-hmm. you kind of do when you collaborate with me, but. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So did you see this photo of me from 1985 wearing an anti-gun button? Yeah, man, it's pretty awesome. I'm gonna uh, post that. Sans, sans the button. I don't know if that's gonna be the uh, f- the picture for today's cast, but it's gonna be the uh, you know the thing. You've got a very chiseled white boy rock star face. <laughs> I kind of look in a good way. In a you good know, way. I kind of look like um, Adam Curry looked at that time, but I dyed my hair black, and I think it was so I wouldn't look like Adam Curry because people kept telling me I looked like him. Kind of look like uh, Henry Rollins a little bit too, but not, yeah, you know, a real swear, yeah, a young, swear young draw Henry Rollins. Yeah, before he started lifting draw. weights. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, that is backstage at a Butthole Surfers Dead Kennedys concert in Washington D.C. in 1985. My nice. band Baby Opaque was supposed to be on the bill, but when we showed up, the local promoter had bumped us for another band called Reptile House, who actually uh, ended up. I ended up being really good friends with their drummer in L.A. years after our bands broke up. Uh, nice. London, London May is the guy's name. What uh, what is Butthole Surfers like live? Is it a normal setup, or do they have something interesting? Because they know, were in insane, their... insane live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, as far as uh, instruments, did they have like uh, oh, a drum normal. machine or a DJ, or or was it just they all had? Standard? Well, this was before they did that song. Uh, there was a hit that was obviously done in Pro Tools with a drum machine, but no, they had <clears throat> two drummers. A male and female who two claimed drummers. to be sis, okay. sister okay. and brother, but wow. weren't. Um, well, that's they two, interesting. They had two drummers for a while, then they had one drummer. But they had two drummers, uh, bass, guitar, two guitars, and both the guitarists sang. Um, and then they had, sometimes they had a, a nude female dancer, and they nice. usually had projections behind them of like eye surgery and things like that. Um, awesome. And they had a smoke machine and they had strobes and they used a lot of loops and effects and stuff on okay. the vocals and on the drums. And, uh, you know, for guitar, bass, drums and vocals, it got really trippy. And I think occasionally they'd have someone play saxophone or trumpet if they were like in the town where their friend who played that was. But nice. it was a swirling mess visually and audio wise that worked really well. I mean, it was awesome. a friend of mine saw him in New York City. It was awesome. He said their singer, Gibby Haynes, uh, had this weird effect on his guitar, this kind of like repeating echo effect. And somebody in the audience threw a beer bottle at him and hit him square in the forehead. And he literally just fell forward and passed out for about five minutes. And when Jeez. he hit the ground, you know, the guitar went ka-chunk through the speakers. And it just got louder and louder with the delay until it was just overwhelmingly just filling the room and like breaking your bones like and uh you know the band was like standing over him trying to revive him and nobody turned off that effect or that pa and it was just like painful It was pretty funny but that was like a typical day for them i met them when they played Charlottesville, Virginia, and I was chatting to him backstage, and the guy was telling me what drug uh, – Paul Leary, the guitar, the lead guitar player, was telling me what drugs he was on. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he was kidding. And he said, in the past 24 hours, I've done LSD, speed, pot, alcohol, cocaine, and a whole bunch of downers and some PCP. Mm. So good times, good times. I don't know. Mm. They're still mm. around for some reason. And we have a uh, <laughs> a fan who was their sound man. So if he ever wants to be interviewed, uh, I'm going to interview him actually on the Anarchy Gumbo. I think that's because he's, you know, okay. of all the sound guys that give us advice, he's the only one whose advice I've ever taken. And part of it is because he did sound for the Butthole Surfers and for on tour, which is you have to know what you're doing to be hired by a well-known band to be their sound guy. Oh, you yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. And he did sound for some like pop country chick who 
you know, you probably couldn't get away with as much weirdness as you could with butthole surfers who had to have crystalline clear sound. So he knows his stuff. Yeah. Score, man. Yeah, that should be a good anarchy gumbo. I think a, a little break here. Okay. Sell some things. I'm going to get a beverage here. I'm All right. A, a tasty beverage? Tasty, tasty beverage. Some tasty wheat? Mm. That's a Matrix yep. reference. All right, man. Be right back. You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well-crafted blueprint to create an ever-increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing. Buttons! Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for guns and weed the road to freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to FreedomFiends.com and click on the link at the top that says Buttons. Want to contribute to liberty but short on cash? You can help the Freedom Fiends without even spending a post-1964 dime. Download uTorrent and start seeding Fiends episodes and DVDs to help keep us drone-proof. There's a Torrent Club link at the top of FreedomFiends.com. There you'll find our Torrent RSS feed and instructions to grab past episodes and automatically download new ones, even while you're away from the computer. You'll also get special episodes of The Fiends and Anarchy Gumbo days or even weeks before regular podcast subscribers who aren't torrenting. Leave your computer on, seeding the torrents while you're at work or asleep. The more people seeding The Fiends, the more drone-proof we'll be when the boot comes down. This is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends. I've been on the World Wide Web since its inception in 1994. I've tried dozens of web providers in that time. The only one that hasn't broken my heart is HostGator. HostGator has unlimited server space, unlimited throughput, and a guaranteed uptime of better than 99.9% .9 for only $150 a year. You can pay a little less elsewhere, but you'll pull out your hair dealing with anyone else. HostGator has great service and unlimited tech support only a phone call away 24-7-365. HostGator is where pros like the Fiends host because we know how to do it right. Go to FreedomFiends.com and click on the HostGator affiliate link on the right sidebar to sign up today. What does freedom mean? Tune in to LRN.FM to find out. LRN.FM is the Liberty Radio Network. A collection of live talk radio and podcasts, all coming from a principled pro-liberty perspective. LRN.FM show hosts aren't left, right, or conspiracy kooks. You can tune in 24-7 to LRN.FM via your phone, computer, satellite, and more. Listen free anytime at LRN.FM. That's LRN.FM. Nima. Yeah. I've been accidentally haranguing strangers on your behalf. Really? What have you been doing, Michael? Well, you were talking on the phone to your mother and uh, about you know what you want for Christmas. And I was like, oh, I know your mother because she's, she's my friend on Facebook, or she used to be. Apparently, she deleted her Facebook account. So I typed in her first name on uh, Facebook, and the, you know, the person, the woman in Houston who came up that I thought was her, I started typing and said, Nima wants an SM58 microphone for Christmas. They have them at Guitar, Guitar Center. They're about 100 bucks. blah, 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 blah. And she's like, okay, Merry Christmas to you too, smiley face. And then I said, Guitar Center employees work on commission. They'll try to upsell you, blah, blah, blah. Just be firm with what you want. And she said, okay. And then she said, we're struggling right now. And when in, when in the market for a guitar, we'll check with you. And I was like, I can help with that too. And I'm like, wait. An SM58 is a guitar, a microphone, not a guitar. And she's like, who's Nima? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized I'm talking to the wrong Lisa. Like, basically, I'm talking to some stranger saying my co-host wants her to me to, she should spend a hundred dollars on buying this guy. She doesn't sure. know a microphone. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. But we got it straightened out and I will definitely help this lady pick out a guitar when it's time and give her a lot of time and effort to do so uh, to make up for that confusing, confusing exchange. Good job. Yeah, I guess yeah. some internet uh, privacy concerns are very low-tech solutions. Like, don't talk to the wrong person. Yeah. Good job. Good job, yeah. Michael. Good job. Good job. I, what did you tell her about? Did you tell her anything that is private information to her? No. Like, like, 
how do we help with Nima's hemorrhoid problem? No, I talked about <laughs> what you want for Christmas, and then she's like, okay. "Who do you want me okay. to buy something for?" I have children but, of my but, own, and I'm struggling. Go away, just, weirdo. H- how long have you been confusing her for my mom, though? Just today, because your mom okay. used to be my friend on Facebook and deleted her email, her account. When? Uh, I don't know, like two or three months ago. I yeah, but you know, I don't talk to her that often. I talk to her more often when she calls in on the podcast, and then mm-hmm. you you leave the room mm-hmm. to go and take a break, and she and I talk live on the radio about sex. I hate but, you. Uh, <laughs> I hate you. Did you say I hate you? Sure. <laughs> well, you had your chance to talk to my dad about anything you wanted, but it just wouldn't have been as fun. It like, is not fun to talk about to somebody's dad about sex. Someone's like, ninety-one like, year old. Like, yeah, hey, me and your dad talked about how hairy your balls are. That's not fun. And you my can't. dad's ninety-one years old and very conservative. He just would have said, um, right. "Is this his live?" Ball- I don't think that that's yeah. an appropriate question to ask me. Nama. Plus, his, his balls got to be way hairier than mine. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you think you're harming me, but you're really just grossing out our audience. I know. I'm, I don't. Think I'm not harmed. You. Yeah, not harmed at all. I'm. Uh, I just think he would have been confused and irritable, whereas your mom kind of laughs and goes along with it and likes my questions and you know, yeah. Mm, mm, okay. Okay. Go ahead and say I hate you again if you want. No. No. Okay. We'll just we'll just move on. Let's stop talking. About I mean, I don't really parents. think of her as your mom. I think of her as someone I know that calls into the podcast that's funny and smart and and you know I talk about sex with people who are funny and smart. Go ahead and say I hate you. I'll leave you a big I, space right here. Just sample it from earlier. I don't I even, talked, have, I the, I don't even have the energy. I hate <laughs> you so much. I'm not even going to spend the energy saying it again. Reco- just resample it. <laughs> <laughs> I talked over it, though. Go oh, ahead. I, right? hate. I was trying to say it again. You talked over me again. Okay. <clears throat> I hate you. I think okay. I said I delivered it just like that, didn't I? Yeah, close, close to it. Actually, it was a lot more kind of like hand on forehead. Like I don't even have the energy. It was more like I hate you. <laughs> it sounded like you really hated me. So I don't really hate you. Just it was fun to say. Just stop it's, talking it, to it, my mom about sex. It yeah yeah. It sounded like it fit in the context. It well, was, it, was, ta- it was a very contextual hate. I'm trying to talk to your mom about what to get you for Christmas, but, uh, so she doesn't get you, but you know, so she gets you bone storm instead of Lee Trevino's putting challenge. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Fuck Lee Trevino. Ew. Facebook wants me to be friends with Henry Rollins. See, I do it. Unlike every, unlike all the other 10,000 people on there that are friends of his, uh, I've actually met him and hung out with him and, uh, know his home phone number and know where he lives. And, uh, I have, have and tried the, to talk and the to him. He's a D bag with a capital D. I don't. I don't want to be friends with him. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's a liar. Well, he's a statist. Because you're a statatist. Yeah. Doesn't that mean you're a liar, though? Yeah. yeah it means all statists lying. are liars. It means you're lying to yourself. All statists are liars. Not all liars are statists. There you go. There you go. That's how I know you like Venn diagrams. I know I Venn diagrams make you wet. Mm, all over you the like place. like math. Nah, I, like I used to date a girl who was into string theory, and one, you know, she was good and bad, but in the bad. But I asked her one time, like, "What do you think about during sex?" And she's like, "Math." <laughs> and I was like, "Does that mean you're bored?" And she's like, "No, that means I'm really turned on." Mm. Maybe it was a, a crude sex joke, like "I want to multiply" kind of a thing. You plus me equals we, something really gay like that. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. That's kind of kindergarten math. String theory, if you know anything <laughs> about it, is like, um, you know, about 17 levels above advanced calculus. Mm, mm, okay. It's it's about uh, multi multiverses and how the universe really is structured and how there may be yeah. alternate universes and how they're connected. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I know about that, but that's hard to turn into a crude sex joke, so... Uh, I don't know, man. Strings. Strings, yeah. Okay. You try one then. Spider Man has sex with string theory. Eh. Eh. Moving on. Eh. I want to talk about hippies and how much I All hate right. them. Put, 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 put on my okay. Cartman hat. Okay, Cartman. Go for it. I don't really hate hippies, but I saw a documentary that made me need a shower. Um, literally, I got up in the middle of this documentary about hippies and went and took a shower and came back and tried to watch the rest of it and then ended up watching um, Howard Stern's private parts to like wash my palate and feel good about life again. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Okay, it's this documentary uh, called Commune, and it's from 2005. It's on Netflix for streaming, and it's about a hippie commune in uh, California, right up near Oregon, Siskiyou County in the 60s. And they actually had a lot of like home Super 8 footage uh, with sound of the commune, and then they interviewed the people now who for some Mm -hmm. reason a lot of them live in oakland california and it's like if you wanted to move out of the city and go be among nature and it didn't work out wouldn't you move somewhere besides (laughs) freaking oakland california like the stab by capital of the world it's because of oaks it's because of oaksterdam it's the only place they can go sit in a pot shop and smoke it's probably because they came back to san francisco and then couldn't afford it and then uh Mm. went to oakland which is what, what a lot of people do Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Oakland's scary, man. Oakland what, what's scary. so scary about o- Oakland? Did you ever? Did you go there? Did you frequent Oakland? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What was scary about it? Yeah, I had friends remember? there, and I'd take my bike over on the Bart from San Francisco and ride around Oakland. Uh, the Bart, where a, those cops shot that guy laying down in his back. Not that particular. Well, maybe that station. Yeah, but I mean, Bart is the subway there. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's identical. It's identical to the Washington D.C. metro. It's like the the same model number of train and everything off of the same from the same company, which is which is really it's a lot more pleasant. The New York City subway is like antiquated and hot and scary and noisy and falling apart. And the D.C. and uh, San Francisco subway, they stole the right tax money or waited. They weren't the first adopters. That's what it is. They waited until the technology got better and got better stuff. So. Yeah, but you can still get stabbed in Oakland on pretty much any corner or shot or have the crap beat out of you and thrown off your bicycle by homeboys. Or uh, it's not a place I'd go to like live out my golden years of lip hair. Mm, yeah, yeah. But it's a place uh, you would carry a gun with if you were there, right? But you can't legally. Yeah. It's one of those places you really need a gun and will go to prison for having one. Uh, 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 and like your your friends would probably turn you in for having one. You know, it's, I mean, everyone there, a lot of people there are really, really, really lefty Obama humpers. Guns are bad. We need to get rid of them. And it's mm-hmm. bad when the police kill our friends. We need to, like, vote and try to get the police to be better. <laughs> That's so square, man. People are such idiots. Such pussy little idiots that just don't understand anything. Just I'm glad I turned you on to guns, man. If, like, for some reason we ever parted ways, which I don't see, I think you're, like, stuck with me for the rest of your life, motherfucker. But um, <laughs> if we ever parted ways, you know, you, you took me from minarchist to anarchist, and I turned you on to guns. That's that's a good deal right there, even oh, without yeah. all the cool media we made and the friendship we have. But Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the weird yeah. thing I sent you in the mail today for Christmas. Weird thing? Mm. Yeah, the weird? thing the thing I was going to throw out what I'm sending to you. Oh, okay. Cool, yeah. cool. The, One man's trash is Nima's treasure. Yeah, it's part of my reducing Christmas till I can drown it in the bathtub. Oh, okay. So we're going to yeah. let the government drown itself because nobody likes it. But Christmas, you're actually going to forcibly hold down. I'm going to drown water. Christmas in the bathtub. Because <laughs> the government, I just don't even want to touch. It's so icky. But Christmas, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. So I can get right up close to it and choke its little, watch its little eyes bug out while I choke it under the water. Wow. You're such a Grinch. Your heart needs to be I love made bigger. That guy was you need my a little hero. Cindy Lou Who. You need that a guy, Cindy Lou Who. That guy was my hero in that movie. Mm-hmm. So um, this movie Commune, it was about – here's why I want to talk about it. It was about some people searching for lib pair and trying to make a lib pair, you know, trying to make their idea of paradise on earth. Basically, it was a bunch of hippies, uh, you know, a couple dozen hippies from San Francisco and L.A., in the 60s and this happened all over the country and i actually the first time i smoked pot in the 70s was at a hippie commune in new hampshire where my sister took me so you know they didn't die and this wasn't the only one but it's it's the only one that i've seen a good documentary done of where they actually had footage from back then and it's not just old people reminiscing but it's actually like you can see what it was like um first of all they had they had to get the money they found the, the location it was this rural beautiful plot of land in very northern california almost into oregon and they tried to get the money up for it now in typical hippie style what they did to try to get the you know nineteen thousand dollars or whatever that this land and collection of falling down buildings cost they went to rock stars and knocked on their doors and tried to beg them for money and and movie what? stars hmm. Hmm. and they got this- turned Kind of what people did before all the internet begging. Yeah. And they tried 
they said Frank Zappa was one of the people. And I think that this, this documentary is definitely lacking because I wanted to hear how Frank Zappa said no to them because Frank Zappa did not consider himself a part of the hippie community. He was very critical of it. He was very hardworking. He was a very like self-made man. Uh, the, uh, a bunch of hippies showing up on his door. He probably told me to get the F out in, in a very creative <laughs> way. And they didn't say what he said. They just said that he said no. And then they went to some movie star and I can't remember who it was, but it was some like, you know, movie star that was kind of a hippie and uh, like was out. It was some rich person. I can't remember who it was, but they like went out and his servants were out in the yard and they, he said no. So they went out in his yard and there was an empty fountain in his yard and they poured lighter fluid in it and threw an American, no gasoline in it and threw an American flag in it and lit it and said like, this is why you should give us money. And I'm thinking if a bunch of strangers, I don't care about the burning of the flag. That's just a piece of paper and it's meaningless to me. And I don't care what anyone says to that. It's like, if it's their property and they do it somewhere else, I have no problem with it. But if you come on my property and commit arson, I'm going to be pointing a gun at you. <laughs> literally, literally. Seriously. And yeah. you know, California. That's, that's what they're for. <laughs> this is interesting. Arson is so serious. Uh, California, you know, people say it's one of the worst places to own guns. It's not. It's not as bad as New York City and it's not as bad as New Jersey. In California, um, the only time you can legally use a gun in self-defense is for a threat of physical violence where someone is coming after you or one of your loved ones trying to beat you to death or kill you. Um, there is an exception. There's one property crime in California where it's justifiable homicide to use a gun. And that is arson because arson is such huh. a serious, like can kill because it could cause a wild yeah. fire. Ah, yeah. Because it, it might harm the collective. How Californian is that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, I didn't know that. That's yep. a, that's a that's a fun tidbit. That may have changed, but when I checked the laws about seven or eight years ago when I lived there, that was the one exception of the property crime where you could use a gun in self defense. So literally that that guy could have come out and shot those dirty hippies who were burning something with gasoline in his yard and probably got a medal for it. So so if uh, you're in California and have a self-defense shooting, just throw a lighter on the dead person. Well, no. <laughs> and before you do anything in self-defense, you uh, should know the current laws in your state yeah, for self-defense. Yeah. Because well, we, California, I mean, those lawmakers like to make laws, man, and they like to change laws. So, yeah, yeah. But I think you'd like one aspect of this movie. There's lots of beards in it. <laughs> yeah man beards are awesome and uh the only the only person in it i've heard of is peter coyote do you know who he is uh is he the brother of wiley no he's an actor who's been um he's kind of like the hippie that he's he's the hip he was in this commune he's the hippie who like broke out and became a hollywood uh i don't think he's the guy they asked money for he never had much money but he's been an, a bit actor in a bunch of movies that I've heard of, but I can't remember who he was. He was the scientist in E.T. the Extraterrestrial, if that makes sense. That's the only thing I can remember I've seen. And he's been in a bunch of movies I haven't seen. What he mostly does now is interviewed in and narrates um, documentaries about the 60s for the History Channel, or as I call it, the Hippie Channel. <laughs> I thought it was the Hitler Channel. No, they ran out of that. It's now the Hippie Channel. They were doing lots of stuff on drugs and lots of stuff on the 60s. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Hey, that's better, I guess. Well, because a lot of that demographic grew up and, you know, now they're reaching retirement age and their 401ks have matured and they uh, they have money. So, yeah. Uh. So, in this commune, like, basically, they finally got the money somehow. Didn't say how, which I thought was lacking in a, in a storytelling way, too. But they they went out to this land and lived there for five or six years. And people came and went. They said so, some neighbor was interviewed uh, and he said, the men looked and smelled like billy goats and had bowie knives on their hips and furs on their backs <laughs> from animals they killed, which I thought was kind of cool. Okay. They weren't vegetarian. They carried weapons and tools. Uh, and I guess they didn't bathe, but they, they skinned their own animals and made clothes from them, which I thought was kind of cool and kind of like not wimpy hippie. But he said like the first year, all of the women wore sundresses and collected welfare checks. And then the first winter <laughs> come the first winter, nearly they almost all, they nearly died. It, they didn't plan for it well enough. And next wow. year, the women started helping with the hard physical work and did better. 
So I'm wondering how much, first of all, how much of the modern survivalist movement was influenced by the hippie back to the land thing? I've never heard that mentioned, but I think it was. And I think that actually what happened was some of the hippies, um, a lot of people came back from Vietnam, like Marines came back from Vietnam and hated that they were drafted and had to be in the Marines or the army, but they came back with some survival skills, you know, and a government taught it to them, whatever, but they knew, or they were boy scouts or whatever. There were actually a few hippies that knew how to not freeze to death in the winter and how to plan for that. And mm -hmm. I think the survivalist movement may have come out of that. I'd like to hear some feedback on that. If anybody knows anything about that. Yeah. Yeah. I would too. I'd be really interested. But this movie has a lot of uh, naked, skinny women with hairy armpits. And I thought one thing I thought was really funny was they interviewed the daughter of one of these people uh, who's like 30 now and lives in Berkeley and looks like the dictionary definition of Berkeley hippie. And they asked her, what is free love? And she said, free love? Ooh, that's something my parents did when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> What did it mean at the time, though, man? Like, well, this is kind of interesting. That's a okay, pretty foreign concept. I mean, it's not a foreign concept to me, but yeah, it, to me, when I hear it, it's just something people used to say when they're like, you know, back in the day. Well, the libertarian aspects of this movie and the like, where they went wrong. Okay, first of all, they didn't have a bunch of guns. You know, they had their Bowie knives, but that was it. And it was like, really, if you want to mm -hmm. have your own society, you need guns. Um, the the FBI thought they had guns, and actually, the, a FOIA request later said that they thought that this commune was a possible training ground for insurgents planning to take over the Bay Area. Hmm. Which take these, over the Bay Area, really? <laughs> these people couldn't these people couldn't take over their own plot of land in the wilderness right, very well. So. Right. Wow. Um, wow. Well of they, course the, the feds always have to use that as an excuse for something that, that and they did bust them. something over. The sheriff of that county did bust them for pot for growing pot with their mm. um newly formed narcotics unit and busted them and took all the pot plants and brought them back and put them in jail and then um, realized they were tomato plants and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't train narcotics officers that well back then. I, although that happened in Canada recently in a public garden. My um my grandpa in law, we call him Pa. He's got a farm out in the hill country, uh, north east of Austin, and um the feds or the DEA used to do. I guess they still do. They do flyovers, um, and there's a plant that grows native in Texas. It's like it's literally a weed, but it's not cannabis, uh, and it looks oh, similar. Yeah. Like yeah, the leaves look it. similar, and they 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 uh they flew over his farm and assumed that he or wanted to check into if he was growing pot and knocked on his door. This little old. Old, not little, he's tall, but this old square man, as square as square can be, like Hank Hill in 20 years kind of a guy, and, and asked to search his farm for a pot. And, uh, of course, he was very cooperative and everything. But Texas man. loves to do that. DJ actually had a friend um, in the 70s. You know that house plant that looks like pot kind of? It's like darker and shinier, but it has jagged five or seven point leaves. It, it's mm -hmm. easy to confuse with pot. Is that what you're talking about? I don't know if it grows wild, but... Um, I don't think it's a house plant. No, it's got like reddish leaves too. Um, no, no, I, this I is what it's called. This really kind of looks like pot if you squint, and it's a common house plant. Uh, ooh, it's snowing, and the squirrels are merry. Um, DJ had a friend who bought one of those, like a potted plant, at a gardening store for his girlfriend in the seventies, and was driving with it and got pulled over. He had it on the seat next to him and got arrested, and he had a receipt from buying it like, <laughs> call these people up man it has the latin name on it it's not pot and you know he had to get a public defender and get out of your pay bail and uh right right of course friggin of course. texas C yeah because it's a it's a jobs program man it's just revenue funding right even even if they know it's not pot hey gotta give that da some work right gotta get yep, that ticket yep you still gotta pay court fees even if the case is dismissed so part of what I enjoyed about this movie, other than I literally had to get up after 20 minutes and go take a shower. I needed one anyway. I hadn't showered in a couple of days, but I was like, man, this would be a good time. And it was freezing and I went and took a shower and I couldn't finish the movie. But interesting things I learned about like why they failed. Okay. First of all, you asked about like, what was their idea of free love? Um, Everybody at this commune slept with everyone else in a rotate, but they had like a chore wheel for it. Like they rotated <laughs> partners. It was centrally planned and you weren't, you weren't allowed to sleep with the same partner for more than two nights in a row because they didn't want couples to form because they felt couples were an wow. invention of men to control women. Wow. 
So their concept of free love was the opposite. It was, was a chore wheel, man. It was, it was centrally planned free love with lots of caveats and rules about it. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. And, which is interesting because that, that developed a couple years in. But before that, one of their first days there, somebody found like part of an old military uniform in one of the closets of the houses that they'd bought, these kind of like run down shacks they were living in, and found um, – a blackboard and some chalk and a pointer. And he set it up in the main room and started to like write how to plan everything. Like he designated him. He put on this military uniform Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and plan and said like, this is how we should do things and this will work better. And we need to plan everything. And, you know, everybody went to bed and the next morning, nobody could find the military uniform, the pointer or the blackboard. Like someone had taken them out in the woods and buried them or something. So, and the lady said like, and that's how I knew we were dealing with anarchists. And this lady, this lady later in the interview, she was a painter and she was talking about how like, she doesn't understand anarchists. She was just dealing with people who didn't want someone in a military uniform planning it because she said later um, there was a vote and it was, it passed. She won, but it almost didn't win because they they were a lot of people were didn't want her doing art painting by herself because it was selfish and it wasn't involving everybody. Now wow. I don't generally like hippie artists or hippie arts, but hippie art. But I hate more someone who would tell a hippie artist you can't do that because it's not collective. Seriously, seriously. Yeah. So and the I, sex I, was collective and the art had to be collective, and they almost starved to death for some reason. I don't get it. Yeah, I think we all get it. <laughs> so, and that seems to be the common pitfall of of the left is sometimes they started out with ideas of you know statelessness and, and free freedom because and of they, that. You know, they start the a state. First idea. thing they do is start a state. Right, right. Because I think the fatal flaw is to them. Um, the ends justifies the means. All they can think of is the ends, and so what they do is they do horrible means to get there. Like we, we th- that's the problem with communism, right? Is well, we have to have a totalitarian state for a little bit until we can get to the stateless society. Um, but of course, that's the fatal flaw, and and that's where anarchism and anarcho capitalism steps in and says, well, uh, doesn't matter what the ends are if if you make the means correct, if the means are morally right, and people aren't aggressed against, then you. Will Will eventually get the ends and you won't have to compromise yourselves and have a horrible means in the meantime and even even if they were they were trying to run a communist society but a communist society can only work i think at the barrel of a gun these people were so bad at enforcement that they said that for a year there was a guy living there that they were convinced absolutely convinced to a man and to a woman that he was a cia cia spy mm-hmm. Probably and, was. and they didn't kick him out because he was a nice guy they liked they liked his personality, <laughs> and he was helpful, and he did work. Because <laughs> he was so used to working for a living. <laughs> well, I guess the CIA was stolen money, but but yeah, yeah. No, I mean, really, it's like if if I ran some kind of thing that was you know moral, like they were doing, but was looked at as illegal by the government, and the government put a plant in. Uh, the first thing, the first order of collective business for me would be ousting that guy. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I wouldn't trade or work with anybody who wouldn't do it. That's how I'd enforce it. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't share my women with them. <laughs> That's how you get things done. And, I, you know, I ate a steak while watching this movie, which is really fun, watching these people starve from their own stupidity while eating a steak. Nice, nice. What What is it, though? Here's what I don't get. I don't get why communists and that flavor of leftists are so anti-individual because that to me is the other fatal flaw is is that you must subvert the individual to the greater good i know where man. does that stem from and why does that Mao's exist? little why, red why book do... Mao's little red book and Marx. no because 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 Mao... right right but what's the justification i guess what, i mean literally what? Mao's little red book was common in the 60s and popular and had a resurgence of printings and publishings and selling and like that was a standard thing in a hippie knapsack, you know, you had but your that little pot pipe and your little, uh, you know, right. But it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't Mao's original idea though. Mao didn't come up with, that. no, it was like a really violent, corrupted form of Marx. Mm, okay. Okay. Hmm. <sighs> did the, did the Chinese communist share lovers too? <laughs> I doubt it, man. No, okay. no, they, uh, they, <laughs> 
they had it was one wife, one child. Mm, mm-hmm. You were state mandated to not have more than one child. Mm, I think mm. it's still like that in China, isn't it? Or did that come later? I think back then you probably wouldn't have more than one child if you could help it because they would starve to death. Although early on, the the Chinese revol, you know, the Chinese communist idea was originally a totally an agricultural thing. Like agriculture will bring us to strength. Uh, and you probably wanted to have more kids to have more farm workers. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the history of the Chinese turn to communism, really, other than the non-communist ended up on an island. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Yeah, so check out the movie Commune. Eat a steak while you watch it. Watch the hippies starve from their own hubris. And uh, take a shower when you're done watching it, which was for me was about 35 minutes into a 70-minute movie. <laughs> you didn't watch the whole thing? No. Hmm. Maybe there was redemption in the third act. Maybe they all turned into end caps. I'll tell you redemption in the third act. Mark Schisler made a $50 donation. That's pretty awesome. Woo! Woo! Yeah, that is pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. We love you. So we we're going to talk about taking money from tax eaters. You know, like someone like wondering, should if, if I'm pure, can I let a you know cop into my business or whatever? Or you know, basically, if, basically, if you don't trade with tax eaters in some form, you're probably going to starve to death. I mean, if you had to not, if you didn't deliver pizza to people who weren't on the government teat, I mean, students in mental hospitals and jails aren't those mostly what you deliver to? <laughs> Do you consider the University of Texas a mental hospital? No, students, I said. <laughs> students, jails, and mental oh. hospitals. Oh, and, it was an and. It was a conjunction. I thought it was a preposition. I thought you were saying students student and men, mental hospitals. Student men, it was a. It was a. <laughs> it was a compound adjective. Student mental hospitals. Uh, nice. Um, yeah, I guess. Stu- I guess you're right about students, huh? Students are tax eaters in general. I mean, they're all. Most of them are getting financial aid. And just so, the so, existence yeah. of the college. I mean, look at the one in Colorado, which is no different from any state university anywhere. Of where they're not going to let people smoke pot, which is legal under state law, because they'll lose their federal funding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess so. Yeah. Um, I guess you're right. Kinda, yeah, there's, there's not much you can do about about you know not get, doing business with tax eaters. You kind of. I if they kind of wash the money, though, you know, it's not it's not stolen. It it's hard to say. I mean, that that sounds like it a half is. measure, but it's kind of like a veg. There's a lot of vegetarians that'll wear a leather jacket because the cow wasn't killed for meat. It was already killed. It was killed for you know, uh, it's left over from killing for the meat. It wasn't killed for for the jacket. Well, well, there's also vegetarians that won't do that, but they might buy one at a secondhand store because otherwise it's just going to end up in the trash or whatever. There you go. It's, it's has better to be to secondhand. Recy- has to be washed better, better by Better to the- recycle it. My wife tried that though, and she said it was. She was fine with it when she bought it, but then she didn't like walking around with a dead cow on her shoulders anymore. So well, that, she stopped wearing it. That kind of reminds me of how I would feel about uh, this mind puzzler that Claire Wolf posted. She posted on her blog that there was a really nice, really inexpensive piece of land for sale at a tax sale n- near her. And mm-hmm. basically that's money that's been stolen by the government from somebody for not paying rent on something they own. And she was actually considering buying it. The only reason she really didn't was because she didn't have the money. And I'm thinking like, mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. And I'm kind of surprised to hear that from Claire. It's kind of like, uh, you know, she's someone I look up to is very pure and very like, I guess you shouldn't have heroes is what it is. And I still like her, but that really kind of shocked me because even if you could justify the morality of it somehow, which I don't know if I could, but I couldn't live in it. I couldn't enjoy living on that land or living in that house, knowing that it had been stolen, you know, immediately from someone. And you could say, well, every piece of land was stolen, but I guess it's been washed by a bunch of people. And I wouldn't just say owning it, but you know, homesteading it over the years. Um, It's Mm -hmm. a really complicated, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I, I also think it's really complicated. And and first, I do think it's okay to have heroes as long as you don't deify them. As long as they're heroes that are human and flawed and you can take the good with the bad and recognize the bad from the good. I, I don't think there's anything pro- anything problematic about that. Um, as far as something like that, I mean, the thing with tax auctions 
is there specifically that? There's specifically land and property that was seized because somebody failed to pay their taxes. Uh, so you know that violence it, – it, it's like – it's like buying something you know was stolen. It's like buying a hot stereo, buying a hot car, and you, you specifically know it was stolen. There seem, it seems like it'd be different if it were a general auction and you didn't know the origin of it or if, if somehow uh, somebody else bought it from a tax auction and then was selling it. I don't know if there's, there's different levels of removal. Um, but if you're going to a tax au auction specifically for that, then, then you basically know it. But then there's the, the, the counter-argument that... Um, you know, the, the crime's already been done. You're not implicit in the crime. You're just as a market actor trying to get, uh, trying to do the thing that's in your best self-interest, which is what everybody should do. Uh, the problem being that we have the structure in the first place. And, and just because we have the horrible structure doesn't mean that you should have to go hungry or starve because you're trying to be morally upright. Uh, in, instead, what needs to happen is the system needs to collapse or you need to help the system collapse. Uh, so there's those two competing interests in my mind. And I don't know, I, I guess each individual individual has to say which one wins at which specific time. Did you cover the thing you said to me last night about it, about how it's kind of evening a system that's working against you market wise? Uh, yeah, I guess that's the other thing is, uh, I mean, the government reduces our income in so many ways uh, through taxing things at various levels of production. You know, the tax you pay on something isn't just the 8% you pay at the register. There's various levels of production that taxes get add on and all those get passed on to the consumer. Uh, uh, not to mention your income tax and, and all sorts of horrible things the government does to reduce the amount of money you get from the fruits of your labor. Um, so there, there's that argument too that, you know, I have to be as frugal as possible and get things as cheap as I can get them uh, because the government in the first place has taken so much money out of my pockets through opportunity costs and various unseen ways. Uh, so there's that thing too that, you know, anytime I can get some benefit out of this, I must because that's the only way I can really survive and make a living. That's sort of a utilitarian kind of argument. Um, so I guess that's, that's there in the mix too. And that's why it's a complex issue. And I don't know what the answer is. Um, um, and I don't know if we can really judge people for this kind of stuff. Like, I don't know if we can judge Claire Wolf and say, hey, that's that's a no-no, non-aggression principle thing, Claire. Well, I really think that ultimately you have to decide for yourself. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. You de you define, you decide if you're, if you're an alcoholic. It's not a doctor or an expert or a judge deciding it. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to decide where our own lines are and whether we're statist or hypocritical or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, the val the the excuse that you said of like, or the, the justification of, well, it's making up for a system where I'm screwed. I mean, Kai on Bad Quaker Podcast was basically saying it's okay. I think she was saying, if I'm understanding correctly, was saying it's okay to be on welfare because the – I don't think she is, but she was saying it's, she could see doing it uh, because the government has screwed you so much they owe you anyway, which I would have a – I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it, but I can see that. Mm -hmm. And – it's kind of though like where – and people's lines change when they're hungry. You know, I mean, think yes. of all the people that are tax eater, like violent tax eaters, like soldiers, uh, you know, fighting non-defensive uh, non offenses or cops busting people for nonviolent actions who are just trying to feed their families and that's their, their excuse. And I mean, it goes back to like right. you know, the ultimate example is the Hit Hitler's goons saying I was just following orders by sending those – Mm -hmm. people who didn't do anything bad to be gassed yeah yeah and so where is the line because obviously then it's a slippery slope if you say well you got to do what you got to do to survive because the state ruined the economy anyway uh does that include uh joining up the army and blowing up little brown people in afghanistan who are now considered legitimate targets if they have probable uh evil intent um, How do you uh, – do they have like a night vision that he has an evil intent setting or something? How do they know? <laughs> that, that's the thing. They don't know. But there was um, – there were three Afghan kids, like 8, 10, and 12, who um, some Marines saw digging by the road. Uh, this The story of the families is they were digging for Dookie to burn for fuel. Uh, and the Marines, to justify their actions, said, well, they could have been digging a, an IED, a hole for you know a roadside bomb. They were, and, so they were uh, digging shit to burn to heat their home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. That, that, that's what the family say. And the, the, the Marines say, well, you know, that, that easily could have been mistaken for them bearing a bomb. So not all, 
not all Afghan kids are innocent bystanders was the headline in the military times. Um, so basically it's, it's the army or, or the Marines, I guess, in this case saying, well, if we got to kill some kids, we got to kill some kids. So where is the line, you know? Um, and you know, that's like what you just said would appall half of Americans, man, you can't criticize the troops like that. And it's like, okay, you want to know, there's a quote from Himmler one of Germany's, you know, Hitler's right-hand guys who basically said, you know, the way to control a country is uh, through patriotism and to make criticizing the military really heinous. I don't remember the exact mm -hmm. quote, but it's something to that effect. Like literally, you know, the plan, the plan. It's a plan. It was a planned plan of the Nazis of make it so if anyone criticizes the war or criticizes the military, they are a non-human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and we see the results of that thinking, because uh, obviously that's been incorporated, right? I mean, the military is so uber normalized. No matter what they do, uh, all that we, all that the average person, or at least half of the average people in America, th can think of is those Marine commercials played during football games, where they're dancing around with swords and and wearing their white gloves and have their pretty little ribbons on and their neat little uniform, and girls go, "I just love a man in uniform," and all that kind of queer shit. <laughs> Maybe that's why that that hippie at the uh, commune put on that uniform. He thought he'd get uh, he, <laughs> he thought he'd get an extra uh, bonin on on the the chore chart. He'd get two two girls <laughs> for one night on the chore chart. Uh, well, that's so funny because uh, in my in my bizarre world status argument when we did the Dalton show, declined to state was uh, was there should be centrally planned welfare sex, and that's that's what these commies did in their commune was have centrally planned sex. <laughs> It, all, all, all the, the and they censored will be equal. And, they, and they censored the, the artist. They had centrally right, planned right, right. sex, and they and they censored the artist. <laughs> there was a yeah. really great story good, good, in there too about love there, guys. They had a, they had a cow for milk, and uh, then they got a bunch of goats, and they were milking the goats, and there was like the goat people versus the cow people. And the you know well we gotta we don't want to do cow milk it's not as good for you as goat milk goat milk is spiritual and wonderful and they had a meeting <laughs> they had a meeting to decide <laughs> whether to slaughter the cow or not uh, <sighs> you know slaughter it for food or keep it for milk and they weren't vegetarians which I like but really if you're gonna live off the land and try to be vegetarian and you don't have an experience farming or or in gardening or any of that. Your chances of starving to death are better if you're willing to eat meat, mm -hmm. or if not starving to death. So wow. they were smart about that. But uh, and there were wow. some vegetarians, but they <laughs> starved. So they they actually tied the cow up outside the building they were having this in. Like the cow was almost in the meeting. Like he, he could hear them <laughs> in there talking. Sounds like a Chick Fil A commercial. <laughs> and they decided by a very narrow margin not to slaughter the cow by like one wow. or two votes. And then they wow. went outside and they tied the cow up in a bad place where the cow had fallen into a ditch and choked itself on the rope and died. Really? And they thought that was like, you know, God doing it. For it them. was a sign. Deciding. It yeah. was a sign. It was no, divine it's a sign intervention. That, it's a wow. sign that you shouldn't be anywhere near animals because you don't know how to be good caretakers. <laughs> there you go. There you go, man. You know so, when yeah, I stopped I, watching this movie was when they started talking a lot about the kids there, and it just broke my heart. And uh, it, it was like yeah. a really bad environment for kids, I think, uh, from what Sounds they were like talking it. about and from what they showed and from the footage they had. That's when I was like, I can't watch this, man. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I guess everything in life is like that. You've got to weigh the good with the bad. And, you know, I believe in the non-aggression principle, and I believe that people should live their lives by that. But where do you stand on condoning other people's aggression or profiting off of uh, other people's aggression? Because that, that's what this this tax auction is for Claire Wolf's – the Claire Wolf example is if she bought that land at a super cheap price – she would be profiting off of the aggression of the tax eaters who stole that land in the first place. So where where do you draw the line? And um, I guess that's the question. It's up to we you. Leave you with. It's up to you. Although we're is willing it, to judge. Is it though? We're willing to judge anybody if they want. I mean, well, I would say it's not just up to you because in Libair or even in our current society, you choose who you trade with and who you shun. I'm not shunning Claire over this, but like, you know, Stacy Litz, for instance, uh, which is a much more extreme case on the continuum of things I wouldn't like someone for doing. Um, you know, Stacy Litz, I not only won't trade with her or be her friend or 
accept an email message from her, I will go out and just shun her nonstop, and I have. Mm. So it's up to me. It's not up to you. It's not up to you. <laughs> it's not up to the individual. It's up to me. Hmm. On that note, I think that's a good place to end. Um, two <laughs> things. Is. One is well, I can't well, believe I'd never added central scrutinizer to the glossary, but I did that yesterday. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess what I'll go do now is upload this and edit it and put it up and put it on BitTorrent and have Sean Diwali help me and then uh, go check my stats. Because, you know, when you're in a band, you know you're popular because there's people there like cheering you. But when you do a podcast, you have to go just check your, your stats constantly. Mm-hmm. DJ calls it checking my <laughs> traps, like seeing yeah. if I caught yeah. one, you know. Yeah, good job, good job. Yeah. Hopefully, we caught a few. Uh, cool. I'm oh, gonna oh, go, um, oh, we did. We got two new countries we've never gotten torrents from: Morocco and Nepal. How cool is that? That is totally cool. Yeah, yeah. Morocco and Nepal. There are fiends in Morocco and Nepal. I think in Morocco yes. you'd probably get your ears cut off for listening to fiends, but uh, in <laughs> Nepal, I don't know, man. They probably wouldn't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. All right. Both both countries so, that produce good hash, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been <laughs> told. That- I used to read in High Times. I've never seen anything from there, I'm sure. it. Uh, rich people would get it. Mm-hmm. Back when I was yeah. smoking, I don't think I ever got any actual Thai sticks from Thailand or uh, Moroccan or Nepalese hot hash. Although people might have sold it as such because <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a free market and they can get yeah. away with that. They just took some PCP or, and mixed, mixed it with a cow patty and called it or, or, Mor- or, Moroccan or, hash. I guess I should say because the government hindered the market so that right. that didn't happen. You're right. If the government didn't hinder the market, you'd be able to buy, buy Moroccan hash at Walmart. You would be. You would be. And it'd be certified by an independent third party that it was Moroccan yes. hash. Yes. Right. And, and DNA tested by Kevin to prove that it really is the strangest as <laughs> yes it is. There you go. Shout All out right, man. Me. All right. Peace, Mike. Worms. Michael. Love the fiends and want to help out? We do take donations and we put them back into our Liberty Projects. You can make a donation by clicking on the spinning coin on any post. But what if you want to help but you ain't got no cash? Or you made a donation and you want to help more? Here's how you can help. Download and seed our torrents to help keep us drone proof. There's a torrent club link at the top of freedomfiends.com. You can also blog the fiends and share episode links on Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. You can rate and review our movies on Amazon. Amazon and IMDb, you can rate and review the Freedom Fiends and Anarchy Gumbo and our songs on iTunes. That really helps a lot. You can buy our movies and share them with friends or give them out as gifts. And one of the best ways to spread liberty is to buy a bunch of Freedom Fiends buttons and give them out as gifts. Wholesale prices are available and you can also comment on our site or better yet, comment about us on other sites. And please email the site link to all your friends. Thanks for helping spread the Fiends message worldwide to as many Liberty people as you can, especially to those who don't yet get it. You rock. Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, Dean, from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I owe me and that include indoor fiends. No one won't ask for mission, and I won't say please. Freedom fans, for fact that I gotta make clear it ain't about- The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends, make copies, email it to everyone you know, go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to FreedomFiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal, or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.